he rescued us for himself. I want you to think about that because we toss around verses of scripture, God so loved the world, and I tell you, move the world out of the way and put your name there. God so loved, put your name there, that he gave his only begotten son. When you understand that, he rescued you for himself. Not for you, not for me, for himself. <laughs> We are in a series, so if you are just joining us for the first time, or you're here in the sanctuary for the first time, or you're not, you haven't been following along, um, this would be number eight in a series of messages as we're going through the book of Colossians. If you have not seen the messages that came before, tune into the network, go to the homepage. They will be playing these as they become available in their edited form for the network. So just, you'll be able to catch up and I've pretty much, that's my goal is to keep replaying until people are caught up. Um, so here we go. Um, we're, as I said, in the book of Colossians and um, today we will be looking at, at least starting to look at the 13th verse, um, which I will read right now. Um, kind of jumping in in the middle, as you know, many of you who've listened to me, there was no chapter and verse when this was written by the Apostle Paul. It was a letter, so no chapter and verse, but for our benefit, verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Let me go back for a minute because last week we looked at, in verse 12, that hath made us meet, which I translated for you properly as he qualified us. So today, he qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of saints in the light, definite article. So today we're gonna, it's, it's a continuing theme, except I want us to focus on uh, a concept that is basically throughout the word of God, and that's darkness and light, that I'm going to use right now. I'm just kind of almost going to dump a lot of stuff on you before I get into opening up what we're doing here. So let me kind of, I'm going to try and follow my notes, which I, as you know, have a rare habit of not doing. Um, <laughs> so Jesus, his own words, he said, I am the light of the world and went on to say, I am come a light into the world that he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And every person that was following our Lord to all of those and including to we who read it in this day he says ye are the light of the world I have heard many people do much despite to this text it is we are the light of the world because of our relationship to Christ nothing we possess in and of ourselves brings light but the light that we possess is Christ in us. That's why we talk about being in Christ. We become light and not the light of the world. Um, he goes on also to say, no man puts a light under a bushel, but on a candlestick. In other words, light cannot be hid. In the opening of John's gospel, we read in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, this is what's interesting to me. If you really start from cover to cover, you realize, as I said, there's always these kind of paradigms, and light and darkness go throughout the Bible. There is no escaping it. In fact, um, I realize that this is such a, we'll call it a simplistic concept, that it's easy just to discount this and just say, oh, well, of course, people who are in light and people who are in dark, but it's, there's a little bit more substance to that. Um, that same scripture I just, quoted about from John which says in him was life and the light the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not and then it goes on to say there was a certain man named John he wasn't the light but he came to bear witness of the light that through him the one who is the light all men would believe so it's interesting that maybe for John more than any other writer um, and I, we're not in John's gospel, but John, certainly in John's writing, first and second and third and Revelation, we have a lot of light, but don't think that it's limited to him. 
The Apostle Paul's contrast of darkness and light runs throughout Scripture, and we, should, we would do well to kind of, I want to say, load all of these Scriptures at the beginning of the message to kind of see there's a lot of this. Failure to see how much is in the book is failure to understand what a weighty concept this is to be taken hold of. Um, from the Apostle Paul, he says, if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost in which or in whom the God of this world has blinded the mind. And essentially those who would be saved, the glorious light of the gospel cannot penetrate them. Why? As again, I said, the God of this world. So the concepts of when we're looking in, for example, in the 12th and 13th verse of Colossians, there is this inheritance of the saints in the light juxtaposed with the power of darkness and the sum of this where it says being translated into the kingdom of his dear son. So it is inescapable. We know that at the beginning of, in the book of Genesis, for example, we have the first utterance, even though we read the King James or any English version, but the literal the way it unfolds is God did not say, let there be light. He simply said, light be, and it was. So what was even uttered in, if we want to say, before there was light out of darkness, but that that utterance brought forth something into being, and from that there's a whole series of light and darkness. For example, the first day being separated, and he says with that advent, becomes the first day, and we have the first night. And then the spiritual connotations that begin to develop thematically through the Bible. Um, one of the early messages of the late Dr. Gene Scott, the raven and the dove, these concepts that are peppered throughout the book, and they are inescapable. So it's important to kind of get this down right, and then, uh, so I'm just, I've got more that I'm going to read to you, and hopefully you can just make notes here and there. Um, but what's interesting is the Apostle Paul says, there is no communion between darkness and light. So um, what I find fascinating is that in our last study, when it says he qualified us to be saints or partakers in the heavenly inheritance, he qualified us. This qualification includes something that happened to us where we were taken from one place to another. And this, for us, may be, the way I'm saying it, may be a foreign way of thinking. But even in antiquity, if you think about it, anytime somebody captured a territory, they would then transport the people and take them to their land. So, for example, the people that were transported the first wave of those taken away in captivity, they weren't left in their land, they were taken away to Assyria. And those, the others that were taken away in captivity that went to Babylon, it was those that came to claim those people and to transfer them into their own kingdom, to assimilate them. This is what, when we come into the kingdom of God, this is what God is doing to us, and he has a method a lot of people spend time, it's very frustrating for me because they waste their time trying to tell you about a specific time. I'm sure you've heard people in your lifetime try to tell you a specific time, and I mean no insult to anyone who would say this, but they'll try to tell you a specific time specifically when they were saved. But in fact, to do that is actually to gloss over uh, a long, we'll call it a long happening for which we in the moment may become aware of, but we use the term, the theological term, prevenient grace, which means God was acting in my life before I knew he was. So it's important for us to kind of get this concept. We are not born light. We have never been born light, and anyone who thinks that we're born light doesn't understand theology. Our first parents were made, Adam and Eve. They were created. They were made light. But the fall, as I've said, and I, these are words I've spoken to you over the last 15 plus years, plunged the blueprint of humankind 
into darkness. And from that time forward, God's unfolding plan of redemption has been to show the people light, first in the form of a deliverer. That deliverer for the Old Testament was Moses, but Moses wasn't the Messiah deliverer. He was only like a prototype to show people that God could bring people out of darkness, out of bondage from Egypt. So it's important to know one thing. The scripture says, God is light and in him is no darkness. Now, this is a little bit of a, a theological conundrum because it, the Bible says, let us make Adam in our image. God was speaking at that point, which means that we know unequivocally, first Adam made in God's image had to be light. That's why a lot of these old time drawings, you'll see a radiant Adam and Eve in the garden. But actually, and I believe that's true uh, until the fall. And when we think about that, this is why we can jump into the New Testament when Jesus is talking and he says, regarding the eye, he says, if the eye be single, and there's a lot of problems with that word, but if the eye be clear, if the eye can see the truth, the whole body will be light. But the problem is, on our own, we don't have that capacity. So now, let me get into the text, because I'm going to do a little bit of translation, and we're going to look at how this all comes together. So, who hath delivered us from the Greek? And I want you to look at something. So, this word, I'll just put, finet, I'll write up here the translation, who. This word here is a very interesting word, okay? Erusato. Erusato. Umas. So, um, and us. I will tell you what this word, let's bring this down here. So, your King James has the word delivered, hath delivered. All right, let's, let's take a look at this. So, first of all, Let's do some, a uh, little bit of word history here. So this word uh, in its origins stems from an Indo-European group. And let's write in blue here. So those of you who are interested, you've got the Nordic waru. I know it doesn't look at all like that, but a uh, circle of stones around a grave, protecting a grave in the, I'll just tell them to you because I could write them out, but it'd take too long. In the Avestic, the word var, which is a castle or fortress. Sanskrit, varator, which is protector. The Gothic is wargen, to resist, wherein, to defend, from the old high German. But this word appears from about the time of Homer uh, in the Greek, carrying several meanings, to ward off, to guard, to save, to keep, to deliver. Um, and once we move into the Septuagint, as I explained to you, the Septuagint is the Hebrew Bible that was translated into the Greek language two to three hundred years before the time of Christ. If you look in the Septuagint for this word, you will find a heavy, heavy usage that would be they took the Hebrew, they're using predominantly out of 141 occurrences, 84 times the equivalent for this will be, a, will be essentially, Natsal. So this word here, I'll write it for you like this, Natsal, is predominantly the the bulk of the equivalent of this word. But erusato from the Greek carries with it a very important meaning. I'll write it out phonetically again, erusato. I prefer to use, instead of delivered, I prefer to translate how the word actually is meant to be used, which is rescue. So when we're reading our text, and the reason why I put Netzal down as a Hebrew. There's another one, um, Palat, to deliver. Uh, I believe there's one other one. This one, for those who read Hebrew, you should know this one because it's from the same word as Yeshua, Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus, but this is the word for to save. So 
all of these Hebrew words, in fact, I believe there is a total of six Hebrew words that when they went to translate them into the Greek, they used ersato for the bulk of the times, and then sometimes, in, in a lesser amount, the Greek sozo, for salvation or to deliver. So this word becomes important. For example, if you were reading the Septuagint in Exodus 6, 6 through 6, 9, and it's speaking of the deliverance or the children of Israel being delivered, they are using this, essentially, this word in the Greek to denote how they were delivered out of Egypt's bondage. So there is a sense, and it's a, it's a nuance that I want to just kind of emphasize, of rescue. Now, that's still deliverance, but the difference between when you say, I was rescued, it means there was danger, there was imminent danger attack, attached to the condition that I was in, and the need for me to be rescued, it's like all other operations have failed, and some special team needs to come in and rescue me out of that danger. That's exactly what's happening here. So I want you to keep the sense of that word, that we were, we were rescued out of something. So it's important to kind of get that word clear. And then, if you follow the use of this word, of this Greek word, erusato, from the time of Homer until the time of the Old Testament, you see a, a huge change, whereas in the Greek realm, there was more of an anthropomorphized meaning. It had more of a um, the gods in caricature versus when you get into the Old Testament and it has a theocentric, God-centered meaning attached to it. In other words, God would be the rescuer. And in fact, if you are to look this up in one occurrence, one time, you'll find that this is actually a name for God in the Septuagint, the deliverer, the rescuer. So I like the fact that when we are doing this type of a translation, digging into the language gives us a sense. You see, he who hath delivered us from the power of darkness sounds very milk toast, it sounds very mild, and to be delivered, like I'll deliver your food, it's like delivering a pizza, it'll be there by 10, versus there was imminent danger. You were in imminent danger. These are ways to drive home a point. So, um, the other thing I'd like to show you, kind of a weird, a weird subject here, which is, as many of you know, I do, lots of language and probing through language, even the Latin translations, as most of you know, there were so many Latin versions circulating that this is why Jerome was commissioned to make a singular, more congealed version of the Latin Vulgate. But even amongst those versions circulating, if you were to look at Qui reduxit nos a poteste potestate. Um, verses, I'll show you another version where, and I'll tell you what they mean too. <laughs> it's probably important. Eripui, nos, and so forth. So we have here in this, in this first one, who, essentially, who recalled us or who led us and another version in this particular definition, which is save or deliver. So even there, they couldn't actually be in agreement. In fact, I found five different uh, Latin words being used, which is kind of a little bit strange, to show you that no one person seemed to grab hold of the essence of this word. So this is the problem. If we don't think we're we, are, we were in imminent danger, the reality of our condition has not been made clear to us. I'm not sure that what I just said will make total sense, but I think a lot of times people minimize the idea that there's a threat or a peril. It's minimized because we don't see it. We don't, we're not living 
uh, in, a, in that daily tension, in that daily threat, because it's not visible, therefore. So when I talk about this subject, I believe there's a great difficulty because surely if one doesn't understand where the risk is, you'd say, well, doesn't, how does that, what does that do for me? So what were we rescued out of? Well, it says here, we were rescued out of the power of darkness. And this too also gets interesting. Um, the exousius tus cotus, um, that exousius, right or authority of darkness. And this is why I made you, when you were here last week, put that definite article of in the light, because if there is the light, there is the darkness. Defining something definitive, not something ambiguous and vague, the light is Christ, the darkness, the power of darkness, is Satan. Now, in, this, in, in the day and age we live in, kind of interesting, you know, we, we refer to historical periods like the Dark Ages, right? The Dark Ages, uh, that period when the Western Roman Empire fell about 476 and the last emperor, Romulus Augustulus, is deposed by a barbarian. And historians, looking back at that time, began to call it the Dark Ages. Uh, there was the Dark Ages of the church. And a lot of, we'll call it, keeping people in the dark. But the reality of this, and I use this as an illustration, is to look back in antiquity and say, these were the Dark Ages, is to not aptly look at today because we're still living in the Dark Ages. Unfortunately, we went through the Age of Enlightenment, which was the Renaissance, the, the rebirth of philosophy and education, but we're still actually, if, if I was a historian now, chronicling this day and age, I'd say we are definitely back in the Dark Ages. If we ever came out of them, we had periodic times. But we're back in the Dark Ages because, and, and it's even infinitely worse, because in today's society, if you ask someone, do you think you are in spiritual peril? The answer will be, I feel okay. I feel fine. I have a great life. Everything's good. Why should I worry? Why should I even think? And I know this teeters on the evangelist part, but I'm saying to you, this is the unfortunate part or the lost part of a message that the church needs to hear and people need to hear, but unfortunately, because we live in a day and age of self-medication and self, or self-medicating and self-information and self-whatever you want to call it, people are less apt to see dangers pointed out to them because we have this kind of bubble we live in now. And that's why I said we are, if you think we are living in an age of light, you're mistaken. Most people do not realize, because it's not even real to them, that there is a danger a danger of the soul. You know, if you take the time, if you have a Strong's Concordance, which is the, the dictionary to the King James Bible, if you take a Strong's and you look up all the words, do a little research and look up all the words for darkness and all the words for light, and there are many of them, and you start looking up all the references, you're going to think exactly what I'm thinking that it's very easy, even for those of us who walk in the light, to actually still be in our minds. We're deceived. And I said, I'm not trying to get people to doubt their salvation. But here's what I want to share with you. Jesus says to his disciples, if my words are in you, essentially, and you love me, you'll do the Father's will, you'll, you'll basically, these words will live in your heart. You won't reject them. Now, the vast majority of people think that church is religion or religiosity, and as long as we go through the motions of doing something, we're, we're light. But the reality is, until we are connected to, to desiring to please the Father and to see Jesus for what he is and to see what we actually are, the light does not come on. The light will not even be there. You and I deceive ourselves, and that's one of the names of the devil. He's the deceiver. 
the accuser of the brethren, the deceiver, the tempter. He leads us sometimes to believe a certain thing. And when we talk about being rescued out of this power, authority of the darkness, we're not just talking about going from a dark room to walking into the light and saying, oh, give me a minute for my eyes to adjust. We're talking about essentially status. Remember I said to you last week, he qualified us to be partakers. That change in status must occur. Now, I can't make it happen. I can't even want to make it happen for somebody else. But that change in status is what God does when he moves us from where we were to where he desires us to be. And I'll read it again because I, sometimes I think people listen to me and they think, I'm saying things. No, I'm speaking scripture to you right now, but I'll, I'll read it to you. He says, And you hath he quickened out of Ephesians 2, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in, in time past ye walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our behavior, our being, in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, with his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, made us alive with Christ. By grace you are saved, and raised us together, up together, uh, made us sit together in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. Many times over, he speaks of this type of a transformation or a transition. So when we looked at qualifying, the qualifying is on God's part, but this word, erusato, is an important word for other reasons as well. See, the Greek helps me or lets me know if anybody's confused about this, this word, let me write it out the way it appears. Erusato is, it's a verb in the indicative, which means, means it's factual. And it is, um, I'm going to put this here, it's a deponent. But what that really means is it's a middle deponent. There's no active in this case, but I'm just going to simplify it and say, he rescued us for himself. I want you to think about that because we toss around verses of scripture, God so loved the world, and I tell you, move the world out of the way and put your name there. God so loved, put your name there, that he gave his only begotten son. When you understand that, he rescued you for himself, not for you, not for me, for himself. Now, why, do you, why would you run the risk of trying to rescue someone who maybe doesn't even know that they need to be rescued, because you know what happens. You've seen this before. We've seen this on the news, people trying to save somebody that fell into a rushing body of water, and the person is flailing around and doesn't really understand in the moment of panic that somebody's trying to help them, and they end up taking the other person in the water with them. Usually, we don't have the capacity until God puts that light in us to know I, I need to be saved. I need to be delivered. I was needing to be rescued from myself, but not for me. When that becomes clear, I'm not sure how anyone could treat God casually if you really believe you were rescued. And this is the problem. This is the actual problem. I believe even with all the teaching I've done here and anyone who's seriously teaching or studying the Bible, how many people actually really believe that they, they were rescued from some imminent danger, that, that they were basically just dangling over the flames and somebody came along and went, whoosh, and you're now safe? It's hard to say. I'm not going to put words in people's mouth. I'm not going to say, oh, well, it's, it, it seems like. But it, sh it certainly does seem like it's treated very lightly and very casually. And I can speak for myself, and I've told you this before, we, I can't speak for you, I, can't, I, I don't, I don't want to speak for you, but I can certainly say that I didn't know. If you, if you backtrack, let's say um, in my 20s, my early 20s, I didn't think I need to be rescued. 
I thought it was okay. I thought I was doing great. The world was great. I'm good. Everybody's good, right? Then you, you begin to step into the light, and the light begins to fill your soul. And for me, this is now several weeks I've done this. This is not self-abasement, uh, a la person who used to attend here, who was uh, not truly understanding when I used to say, I'm nothing. I was nothing when God found me. Then the only thing that I have going for me is Christ in me. That's all I have going for me. When people say, well, you know, that person's a good person. How good are you? Are you as good as Christ? <laughs> and even the best person will never meet the standards of Christ. So it's important for us to see how when we talk about the darkness. Darkness, the condition of all humanity, whether we like it or not, this is how we come into the world and until we are illuminated by him, darkness, first and foremost, is ignorance. I've, I have people tell me all the time that, you know, whether it's in telegraphed ways, you know, I've wasted my life. You know, I've heard people have told me, you know, I, I could have uh, had some great career somewhere. Well, I'm sorry to the bu burst those people's bubbles, but I think I'm doing the most important work that I could have ever done of any task, of any, anything ever given to me, which is to be devoted to trying to show people that, no, we're not born with knowledge of God, and we're not, we don't even begin to understand God until we begin to see ourselves as filthy and dirty. And the closer and the more we step into the light, and the more dirt you see on you, that's when reality of salvation sets in. I always love my example of that infamous black light. You know, you stand under it. I don't know why they call it black light, but stand under it. Because see, suddenly I have lint all over me, right? I, I got spots I didn't even know were there because I stepped into that special light that's showing all of these pieces of whatever they are on me. Move outside of that light, I look just fine. That is what's wrong with most of what's preached in the church. See, you cannot, you cannot take the dirt off. Who hath rescued us from the power of darkness? And that power of darkness, as I said, could be ignorance. Definitely, the power of darkness includes sin. That doesn't mean that, um, when I say that, that we, I sin, you sin, even though we're saved. We're sinners being saved by grace. But it's the type of thing that failure to recognize what the scripture says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But some people think they're not. And everything they do, it's, they're a good person. So here we are. That's another darkened uh, mind. Darkness or the spirit of darkness or the power of darkness is also being blinded from the truth. I just quoted uh, Corinthians. The God of this world, referring to Satan, hath blinded the mind of them or those who would receive so that they cannot receive. How many times have you tried in your mind? You have a friend, you have someone you love who's dear to you, and you want them to know about God, and they want nothing to do about it. Just no, no, no. Now, listen. It may be that it's not their time just now. God has a time, possibly. Or maybe they're one of those people they'll never want to listen. That is being blind to the truth. And what is the truth? We're talking about what's in this book. There is the darkness. Several times you'll read about cast into utter or outer darkness. There'll be gnashing of teeth, referring to a future eschatological time, but speaking of a future that will be in darkness, separated from God. That is the essence of all of those sayings, eternally separated. So when it says he has rescued us from the power of darkness, I want you to take all those concepts I just said and realize any one of those fits the bill, but there's something more important here. There is a word up here, exousius. So that power, and I'll write it in English, exousius. And because it's not exousius, a exousius, power, right, authority. The power of darkness, the authority of darkness. I want you to see this. John says, 
in his opening of his gospel, he says that not all were able to receive, but as many were able to, he gave them the authority, the right to become the sons of God. So we have two dimensions of authority happening. The authority of this earthly kingdom, the prince of the power of the air, the one who rules the world and the flesh, the devil, and the exousius of God. Those two are diametrically opposed. Light and dark are diametrically opposed. And yet we'll have people who will look at this and they won't even see that this exousius inside this text is the same exousius that Paul was talking about when he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these rulers, and he calls them Cosmo Craterus, Cosmo world rulers, Exousius, powers, Archon and Exousius, these lower ranking but still part of that evil army working against the flesh or the people. So when you, when you look at this word Exousius or when it says here power of darkness, don't just think about how I've itemized what that might be Look at how Paul drives home the point there in Ephesians 6, and I believe it's um, verse 12 or so onward, where he's referring to this and spells out, these are forces at work, real, not, not uh, just some you know, amorphous mass, but they're actual powers working in the air about us. Now, if... If you and I are looking at this, and imagine now, I always say first apply to the Colossians and then take it and apply it to us. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, from this authority, who hath rescued us from the, the muscle that would basically keep us in bondage and keep us in darkness. That's the type of rescue I'm talking about. And it goes on to say, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Then the first part of being qualified, what he, what he did in verse 12 that made us meet, being qualified, is rescuing us. And in that rescue effort, several things occur. The reality of the need of salvation, the reality of a savior, the reality of where I was to where I am. It's almost like scales falling off the eyes and suddenly you realize, whoa, this is real. But I hate to tell you, most people treat it like it's a caricature. And by the way, this exousius in this context has some executive authority in it. In other words, if people can be uh, kept in, locked in, if you're convinced, if you're not even aware of the light or if the darkness is uh, something that has the ability to keep you stayed in that place, this is why we would need to be rescued. Now, I'm going to ask you something, and it's rhetorical, so don't really answer it. But do you really think the vast majority of the church world thinks it needs to be rescued? And I'm not talking about the people outside the church. See, that's really where you understand how you understand your salvation. If we say, I needed to be rescued, then I realize completely my condition was this, and I have now moved into this place. God has moved me into his own. But failure to recognize that you needed to be rescued. See, we tend to over-dramatize. We tend to think, oh, it's only the drug, the druggie or the alcoholic or uh, the person who's really bad, societally bad, needs to be rescued. No, we all need to be rescued. And when you quit making these standards of some more and some less, God doesn't see it like that. He says, this is a disaster that needs me to come in and rescue you don't want to acknowledge you need to be rescued, you're going to die there. So now let's look at another part of this equation. Hath translated. I don't really mind that they did this if we really understand what the word means. I didn't write it out here, but the word is methistimi. And I just finished explaining to you what that means. In the ancient world, when one empire won victoriously over another, it would take the population back into its kingdom. 
That's exactly what this, basically, God winning over the power and rescuing us from the power of darkness, taking the people to himself into his kingdom. Now, kingdom, again, you either believe this or you don't. This is not one where you stand in the middle and go, well, let me think about this for a bit. We define a kingdom, obviously, as having a king. And we have the concept here that certainly is that there are, two, there are actually two kingdoms. We shouldn't place them as kingdoms, but as such, there are two territories. The kingdom of God, which consists of what is in that kingdom. There must be a king for there to be a kingdom, and there must be citizens for there to be a kingdom. And we'll call it the power of darkness, or the kingdom of darkness. And what all is there? There must be a ruler there, and we know there is. Ephesians 6 tells me that. Many other scriptures tell me that. There must be citizens for there to be a kingdom. Those are people under that ruler's control, and live according to the system or the premise of that realm. So when we talk about deliverance and being translated or rescued and being translated, we're really talking about some transaction in, as I referenced last week, a change of status that puts me in a new place. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still standing here. I'm, I've been standing here for over 15 years. I've been standing in this church for over 25 years. But prior to that time, my status was over here, outside of this realm. And I may have been the nicest person to you outside of this realm 25 years ago, but I was still in darkness. Suddenly, as I begin to walk, begin to be enlightened, begin to uncover and find out about God, my heart is open, and I'm either open to receiving this, and that is the translated, the word translate. By the way, that word occurs, kind of interesting, in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 2, when he talks about... Um, see if I can find it for you. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 2, when he says... And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and, ha and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, that's the same word as translated. You're starting to see some depth here. Translated, yeah, I mean, listen, I like to translate things from one language to another. But we're talking about movement real movement, not imaginary movement. Now, you may not feel like you've been moved into another realm, but just by the simplicity of your faith in Christ and wanting to build that relationship with him, you have been moved. This is the wonder. See, this is what I, I, I guess I don't understand. Who would want to stay in darkness? I don't, I don't understand that. Furthermore, if you want to take it to one step further, this is what I love about the Bible. If you read enough stuff in here, you're going to see some very cool things. So we're talking about being rescued, right? And being moved into another realm. In Matthew 6, when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, in that prayer that people call the Lord's Prayer, which is not the Lord's Prayer, it's the Disciples' Prayer. In the 13th verse, 6 and 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That word deliver is the same, erusato, rescue us. Some translations read from the evil one. So don't think this is just a, the Apostle Paul's anomalous nuttiness. This is through the Bible. And it is a battle for the soul, and failure to recognize this as a real battle puts you in the realm of people who basically, if you're not understanding, you're still in darkness because that ignorance equation plays out heavily. Now, I bet you I could step into, and there's a particular church I'm thinking of because somebody sent me a, a, a commentary on a particular pastor. And I, listen, I'm not into the art of picking on people for the sake of, OK? But I'll tell you what I find grossly offensive. 
I find it grossly offensive when either a man or a woman, don't care what your gender is, start to use this book to manipulate people for their own doctrinal ideology. This particular pastor, I'm, I, and I know it's true because he's got a long history of this, is condemning, again, I deal with this all the time, do I look like I care, really? <laughs> There are things to care about and there are things to just not care about, but I'm sharing for the sake of showing you how ignorance, even in the church, prevails. So this pastor, who's actually been pastoring and supposedly teaching for, I'm gonna say, probably the better part of 45 or maybe even close to now 50 years, is telling his congregation, because I guess somebody maybe brought up my name and said, you know, have you heard? You know, she's, got, she's a si solid Bible teacher. There, there are no such thing as women teachers in the church. They can't teach. They should go home. They should just have children. Well, let me just tell you something. If I could have kids, I might consider that. Maybe. But of my own volition, and because I desire to, with, hopefully with somebody, if that, if that was the case, but not because somebody says that's my job or that's my realm. In fact, what I find offensive is failure to recognize that when God calls somebody, now there are a lot of people who stand and say, well, God called me and God, I've told you I fought against this. And still probably by the fact that I'm telling you this, does there's still an element of me fighting it. I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask to be here. I'm, not, I, I'm very grateful, by the way. I'm grateful to God that he thought there was something in me, in, of him, that could be useful to him. But I, this is the type of darkness, and I, I use this because it was just in my office just before I came in here, but it could be any example. A dark mind that wishes to take, and I, when I say man or mankind, I mean it generically. I don't mean in accusing a gender, okay? But our human brain, the way we work, will always go to take certain elements that we feel either by having been ingrained by bad theology, bad ideology, or by tradition, which makes void the word of God. And we indoctrinate people into that. So a whole body of people listening, and they believe their pastor is right. I'm going to tell you something. There's only one right voice, and it's in here. No man, no woman, no individual can claim the right of being right apart from this word and rightly dividing it. And if one who is given the charge, such as myself or this other pastor or any pastor, will not take the word of God and treat it as Paul said, we didn't try and do it deceitfully or crafty, craftily manipulate you, but if the word is not putting out, being put out truly and carefully and methodically, which leads to error if people take texts out of context, then all that individual has done is bring more people that are in the church into more darkness because the people who are listening will not be Bereans and study and look it up. I've told you, anything that I say, please look it up for yourself. You know how you look it up? You start by seeing, is it repeated? Is it repeated? One time is not a repetition. Two times, maybe we're getting there, but if the Bible has something repeated over and over and over and over again, that's sound doctrine. If you take one thing out of one place, out of context, it's error. Now, if I'm indoctrinating people or trying to give them doctrine and it's not sound, I'm no better than the Church of the Dark Ages that basically hid the word and all you had to do was listen to the priest the priest could tell, people were illiterate, they couldn't read, they didn't have a printing press, so they didn't have mass-produced Bibles. And you were subject to listening to what the priest said. And if the priest said, well, A, B, C, D, Y, and that's the alphabet, then that was the alphabet. That's why I said we're no different than the Dark Ages now, because we're still, we still have people in pulpits who are trying to shove social agendas down your throat rather than telling you Jesus Christ only sees one color of blood, one color, one color, not a rainbow of colors. In him we are one, the Bible, especially through the Apostle Paul, tells me that. So I'm not sure if you can understand when I say just from a pastor's perspective, 
There's still a lot of darkness, even in the church, and then on the part of the parishioners. And I say this with a heart of love, nothing more, nothing less. I make mistakes, just like you. And when I make mistakes, I have to face those mistakes, deal with those mistakes, not because of my position that I can somehow navigate around my mistakes, but I also have to lead by example and show people that there is a way that God has given us. That way is not through abasing other people. It's not through subjecting other people. It's not through mandating. It's showing. It's putting out that information and you taking that information, chewing it around, investigating, doing some work that then you can say, we're talking about your soul. We're not talking about disposable razors and plates. If you don't care enough about your soul to do a little legwork and, and dig into what I'm saying, then you must not care about where you're going and where you're going to spend the rest of your time when you leave here from this earth. That's my concern. And we, we think just because a church is set up and a church exists, or people that come to the church, that somehow that's eradicated the darkness. Well then, please, Again, do yourself and me, do us all a favor. Go back and read church history because through church history we glean that cyclically corruption, uh, the things that we, we, we want to keep out of the church, they've crept into the church. Unsound doctrine. Non-theological dogmas. Let me, I'm sorry, I, you know, when you get me started on this, it's, it's difficult for me to stop. I'm sorry, but... Let, let me ask you this. We, we could have done away with hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of children being abused in the Catholic Church. We could have done away with that. It would not eradicate all pedophilia. But when you tell a human being that God made and God designed them to use their body, now, not to use it carelessly, but to use it to reproduce, to take a wife, God's mandate to take a wife or to take a husband. And you make a mandate as dogma for celibacy. You don't think that's setting up a little recipe for disaster? Now, what's interesting is before young boys were targeted in the church, if you look far enough back in the Catholic Church and the history's there, I'm not saying anything that's not true and not chronicled or written. Many of the high-ranking bishops, many of, if you go down into history, you'll see had wives and concubines and children, and, and all of this was done in secrecy because God forbid anybody would, would hear about this. We're living in as dark a time, if you think about it, because we've not changed our ways. Now, this is not the Catholic Church, and the Protestant Church has its own issues, trust me. All I'm saying to you is it's time for us to really take a good assessment of what the light looks like, the light that comes out of this book, that comes out of the words that are translated to our hearts by the Holy Spirit, look radically different from some of the dogma and some of the teaching and some of the hate and some of the things that should never be uttered in a church and unfortunately still happen. That's why I said we're, we're not out of the dark ages. But the only thing I can tell you is for those of us who, who understand what it means, I use that word to be translated, just like those people who are moved from one place to another, I may still be here, but the Melissa Scott that was here of old has been moved into that place, spiritually speaking, and as long as I stay connected in the faith, as long as I stay eyes fixed on him, and I don't start taking these other, we'll call them dogmas and traditions and things that have nothing to do with my salvation. And I recognize suddenly, this is the difference between darkness and light and why I needed to be rescued. See, I used to think, I used to think going into a church, kneeling down right before the communion table, that was, that was the way. And the way was, you know, these, this is the formula. And then I now realize, you know, years later, there is no formula. There, actually, there is one, and that is the Lord saved me, and I look to him. He is my savior. Lord, save me. That's my formula. 
No prayer beads, no prayer cards, no special uh, regalia and all the... It's a fantasy of things that people invent in the church. I told you, so you don't think I just strictly bash on Catholics. For God's sake, I was in a Protestant church, and I've told you this before. They do dumb things too. Okay, you want to know super dummy movement here? I told you, I think you might have been with me, the waving of the flag to move the Holy Spirit around. I'm sorry, wait a minute. This is part of the Godhead. And you think that by waving a flag on a stick, you're moving him across the room? Well, okay, that's stupid, and it's also ignorant, therefore darkness. You really think that God needs to be moved around by your hand like you have control? Wow. I was there, I saw it. <laughs> and then, then, then they start singing the song, Breathe On Me. And I decided, exit stage left, friends. Don't want anybody breathing on me right now. I'm done with that thing, right? So all I'm telling you is this. It's our responsibility. Each person is responsible to understand this. It doesn't mean you have to understand it perfectly, but the understanding between darkness and light and the power of darkness, the exousia of the, the Greek word skotus, is all around us. Don't think that you have to go into a dark place to find it. It is even in the pseudo light. So to those listening to me, be, be vigilant. Be, be vigilant enough to take it upon yourself that when doctrine is being preached or people are delivering, you can listen to many people. Many people here also listen to other people. I'm not the only person speaking the word of God. You make sure that it's sound and it's not um, some elitist little group here that says, well, we got the message and the rest of you don't. Or that there is, as I said, a deception of darkness. That is perverting God's grace and his message. I will stand here. And by the way, I would welcome this particular pastor, and he's not alone, by the way, but I'd welcome him. He's too much of a coward to stand in front of my face and say those things to my face. See, the problem with that is called hypocrisy. Now, one thing I'm not, at the end of the day, what you see is what you get. And some people say, well, you could be a little bit more spiritual, and you could be a little bit more this. Well, it could be a lot of things, friends. But there's only one thing I'm considered, I'm, I'm worried about, I'm concerned about, and that's, is God's word being delivered? I cannot make people eat. I can claim the scripture, taste and see that the Lord is good, but I cannot make you ingest, I cannot make you masticate, and I cannot make you say, wow, this is awesome. But if that's what God has placed in your heart, then thank God that he's given you the gift of sight and the gift of light. Praise God, that's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.